Okay, welcome back. So if you recall, last time we had studied classical Yang-Mills theory, and I had argued to you that um, though we're told that the theory of the strong interactions, QCD, is described by an SU3 gauge theory, the classical gauge theory did not seem to be in agreement with what we observe in experiments around us, basically that there are no massless gluons and that quarks are always bound up into protons and neutrons. So, um, and I told you that that happened because the classical theory is not enough. We really have to understand the quantum theory. And to that end, um, we're now going to learn how to quantize non-abelian gauge theory. Okay, so we're going to do this um, without the quarks. We're just going to begin by studying pure Yang-Mills theory, which, if you recall, from last time has the following action. It's one quarter f mu nu a, f mu nu a, where um, A runs over the Lie algebra indices. Okay. And um, so now to understand the structure of the quantum theory, let me first uh, take this f mu nu A and expand it out in terms of the gauge field. So f mu nu A is d mu A nu A minus d nu A mu A plus g A mu B A nu C f A B C where f is the structure constant. Okay, and I just remind you again, this is just pure Yang-Mills without the quark, without the quarks, sorry. Okay, so note that because this field strength already has this nonlinear term in it, the action of pure Yang-Mills theory alone is already a non-trivial interacting theory. The action is not quadratic, okay? So we see here a difference between the abelian and non-abelian case. In the abelian case, the theory of the pure gauge field was a free theory. However, in the non-abelian case, we are stuck with the fact that it's in, or in, interacting from the very beginning, even if I don't add any actual explicit charged matter. The theory of the gluons alone is, uh, is inter interacting quantum field theory. Okay. In particular, there's going to be one interaction vertex, which you can see more explicitly if I expand it out. So let me do that. So the action, where I just plug that in, takes the form minus one quarter times d mu a nu a minus d nu a mu a plus g a mu b a nu c f a b c. Uh, multiplying d mu a nu a, again, minus d mu a mu a, plus g a nu d a nu e, f a d e. So we can see here that because these are multiplied, there's going to be one vertex that has two gauge fields from here multiplying this, so there's going to be one vertex that involves three gauge fields in the theory, and it's going to be one vertex that involves four gauge fields coming from when this guy multiplies this guy. All right. So there'll be some non-trivial interactions already. Now um, it's quite possible to work out the vertices, the, these vertices using our usual techniques. Nothing really very dramatic happens here, so I don't really want to go through it in great detail. One thing that I'll point out is that um, this is the first example that you've seen. Um, where the interaction term involves a derivative. Okay, there's an interaction that looks something like dA times two powers of A. And so the interaction term involves the derivative. And what that means is that the momentum that's incoming into the vertex appears explicitly in the rule. Okay, so um, you can work out the details of this. Let me just show you what you get. It's just bookkeeping, so I don't want to go through it in full detail. So in particular, there's, a, there's one vertex that looks like this. This is a three gluon vertex or a three gauge field vertex. It comes from a term like this in the action that takes the following form. Note that the momentum appears explicitly here, where k is the momentum coming in. And um, if you want to write it down, you can pause the video and write it down. I, I don't think this is strictly necessary. It's in the notes and in every textbook. And also there's a four gluon vertex, which comes from the product of, of two gluons from the f mu nu and two gluons from the other f mu nu. And it takes this rather complicated form there's a lot of indices. This is because everything, every gluon carries both a gauge field index and a Lorentz index. And there are many ways to combine everything together that are fixed by the group theory and the Lorentz invariance. 
Okay, there's a lot of information here, but the structure is highly constrained. Note that the whole thing is controlled by just a single parameter, g. Okay, it's just a single coupling g which controls this whole structure. It's highly constrained by gauge invariance. Okay. So now that we have all the vertices worked out, we should now uh, quantize the theory. And in particular, what we want to do next is derive the propagator, just like we did for the abelian gauge field. OK, so um, we're going to really follow the same fadev popov steps that we did in the abelian case, but we'll see it's going to be a little bit more interesting this time. We're just going to do the same fadev popov thing. And there'll be a new wrinkle in the non-abelian case. So just think back to what we did there. If you recall, there we had a gauge fixing function, which I call g sub omega. And we do the same thing here. We pick some gauge fixing function, g sub omega, except that now we have one of these for each element of the algebra. OK, oops, this mu should be upstairs. Now we have one of these gauge fixing functions for each um, for each direction in group space, okay? But we still have, just like before, a gauge fixing function. Okay. And um, again, if you recall over there, we um, we sort of wrote defined something which was the gauge transform version of the gauge field. We'll do the same thing again there, again here, sorry. In particular, define a general gauge transformation. Um, like this. So here, um, the gauge transformation is some element of SUN or really it can be any group you like, but let's stick to SUN for simplicity. And it's parameterized by this alpha sub A. Alpha sub A is, or alpha super A is some function of X, which changes as you move around, and it parameterizes the most general gauge transformation. Okay. So let me denote the gauge transform of A by A superscript alpha. So to be a bit more precise about this, the precise definition of A superscript alpha is that A alpha, which is has a group index and a Lorentz index, is equal to the original alpha. Oh, excuse me. Times TA is defined to be the gauge transform of A. So it is using the formulas for gauge transformation that we had previously, this turns out to be TA plus I over G D mu, and this whole thing multiplies the same thing here, except with a plus sign. And I have messed up my signs, I'd rather put a plus and a minus there. Okay, and now it's correct. Okay, so this A superscript alpha is just the gauge transform of A uh, by the gauge param transformation parameterized by alpha. Okay. Okay. So um, next, um, it turns out to be helpful to work out the infinitesimal version of this transformation. So let me do that. If I now expand this thing only to first order in alpha, then I get a different relation, which looks like this, alpha a mu equals to a a mu plus one over g d mu alpha a plus f a b c mu b alpha c. Okay, 
And so this is the infinitesimal version of that gauge transformation. And now I want to point out something which is helpful. You see, it turns out that you can write this in the following way. You can write this as 1 over g times the gauge covariant derivative of alpha a. Okay. Now, alpha a you can think of as something transforming in the adjoint of the gauge group. And this whole thing here is just the gauge covariant derivative of that thing in the adjoint. In particular, we previously derived a formula for the gauge covariant derivative of something in the adjoint, any field in the adjoint. Think about alpha a, the gauge transformation parameter, as such a field, and plug in that formula, and you'll see that you get exactly this thing over here. So let's just compare this to the abelian case, which is very similar. The difference from the abelian case is coming in here. There's this new term here, which wasn't there in the abelian case. Okay, That's where all the fun is going to come from. Right? So this is an intrinsically non-abelian term, which is going to introduce some con con um, complications for us. Okay. All right, so um, now, uh, just like before, if you recall in the Farev Popov procedure, sorry, in the abelian case, we inserted one in a very fancy way. So we're gonna do the same thing again. Insert one in a fancy way. And one here is going to be, again, a path integral over all gauge transmission parameters alpha, a delta function, of g sub omega, a gauge transformed by alpha, times a functional determinant, which is delta g sub omega, a alpha, delta alpha. Okay. And now we plug this into the path integral. To find that z, the partition function, is integral dA, integral d alpha, delta d sub omega e alpha times this determinant delta alpha times the exponential of i times the action. Okay. So this is the gauge fixed form of our path integral. So now we're gonna finally encounter a difference with the abelian case. In particular, let's consider this operator that appears inside the functional determinant. So what is that operator in this case? Well, that is this, which is of course delta delta alpha of partial mu a alpha nu minus omega. And now if you work out what that was from my earlier formulas, you see this is partial mu times a mu plus one over g d mu alpha minus omega. And now the only thing here that depends on alpha is this piece right here. And so we get that this is 1 over g, d nu, capital D nu. Okay. This here is now the covariant derivative operator acting on the adjoint. Okay. And you see, this is now a little bit different. Okay. Because in particular, this has an A in it it has a gauge field inside of it. And so if you look at what we're path integrating over, because there's an A now appearing in here, we can't just take this whole thing outside the path integral anymore, which we, as we could in the abelian case, all right? So this is the difference from the abelian case. We have to worry about this determinant. Okay, so we will, but for now, let's just write down what we have. We have Z equals to um, sorry, let me just say that uh, from now, except for that, what that means is we can't take the determinant out 
So we have to now worry about the determinant. And we will. But everything else goes through the same way. Okay, so in particular, we do all that stuff. We integrate over all omega and so on and so forth. But we do all the rest in, as in the abelian case. And so at the end of the day, what you find is the following. Okay, so this comes from the same place that did in the abelian case when we integrate over all omega, we get a term like this. And this is the new thing. In the abelian case, we took this determinant outside and forgot about it, but now we have to deal with this. Okay, so how do we do that? Now, you see, the determinant is a completely well-defined object. But the point is, we would like to have a useful way to think about it, a useful way to represent it in the path integral. Okay, And uh, there is such a way. In particular, think back to two, three lectures ago when we studied Grassmann integrals. Okay, So recall Grassmann integrals. Over there you learned an interesting thing. You learned that if you do a path integral over a Grassmann variable, you get a determinant in the numerator, not in the denominator. That was a crucial fact about Grassmann integrals. And so that suggests that one way to represent this is in the following way. I can write the determinant of d, d nu d nu as the integral over some new Grassmann variables, which I'm going to call c. Okay. So in particular, I can write the following expression over some new field C, where let me tell you a little bit about what C is. C A of X is a Grassmann field that transforms in the adjoint under the gauge group and is a scalar in space-time. Okay. So this is a device that I have created in order to represent this path integral, this determinant, in a useful way by doing a path integral over these fields. Okay. So these fields that I've just made up are called Fadev Popov ghosts. Okay, and I will say a lot more about these ghosts. Uh, this is meant to be a ghost uh, in a second. Okay. All right. So now let's just take this and stick this into here, and we then see that our path integral takes the following form. Z is an integral over dA, dC, dC bar, and it's an exponential of I times the integral d4x. So let me first put in the, um, the old part. This is the normal non-abelian part coming from the, the Yang-Mills action. There's a new part coming from the gauge fixing, which is d mu a nu squared. And finally, there's our new ghost part here. C bar. C. Okay. And this is our new form of our action. So basically, just to recap, we have completely gauge fixed the action. We can totally work with the action in this picture. But the cost is we have to introduce these new mysterious particles, which are called ghosts. All right. OK. So, um, so first, the good news. The quadratic part of this action is the same as in the Maxwell theory. So in particular, if you examine the quadratic part, 
of action, it's like um, having d of g, where we call this the number of generators in the Lie algebra, it's like having d of g copies of the free Maxwell action. Okay. So in particular, um, um, you can now diagonalize that thing, invert the propagator, and so on, to get the new gluon field, the new non-abelian engaged field propagator. This is no different than the previous case, except that we now have an extra Lie algebra index floating around. But you can convince yourself everything is in fact diagonal in that basis. And so the propagator just turns out to be minus 1 minus c mu p mu over p squared times delta a b. Okay. So this is the Feynman propagator for the non-abelian gauge fields. It's exactly the same except for this new thing, which tells you the propagator is diagonal in color space, gauge in, in gauge space. Okay. And in this case, the case where you take zeta equals to one is no longer called Feynman gauge, but it's now called Feynman atoft gauge. Okay, and um, so now is the interesting thing. Let's now turn to the ghost. So look at the ghost part of the action. So let me expand out the ghost part of the action explicitly. The ghost part of the action looks like this. So if I write out the covariant derivative and all the indices on the ghost fields, I get C bar A, minus D squared, delta AB, minus g delta nu f a b c a nu b the whole thing multiplies uh, oops this is a c and this is c c okay. so this is the ghost part of the action and so this is a completely ordinary looking action okay in particular, there's a quadratic piece, and there's an interaction piece that interacts the gauge field together with these, these ghosts. So this is completely ordinary. In particular, we can now work out the Feynman rules for the ghosts. Okay. So what are they? Well, there's a propagator going from A to B, which is just I delta AB over P squared, because this kinetic term is a completely ordinary kinetic term. And also there's an interaction term, which looks like this. C A. And if there's momentum P coming through this leg, then this interaction term turns out to be G F A B C times P mu. Okay. So these are the ghost Feynman rules. And maybe just for completeness, let me write down the diagram that we use for the propagator for the gluon. The propagator for the gluons, the gauge fields, is simply this. It's minus i over p squared times eta mu nu minus 1 minus eta p mu p nu over p squared times delta a b. Okay? So these, together with the vertices that I showed you before, are the full Feynman rules for the non-abelian gauge theory. Okay. And so the interesting thing, of course, is that we now have this ghost propagator, okay, this new ghost propagating around, and um, that's the new fun. All right. So now let's just think for a second how to calculate these, how to calculate things in this theory. You can use these Feynman rules to calculate anything, but you have to remember to include the ghosts. So for example, say you want to calculate the, the gauge field propagator at one loop, there's a term that looks like this. It's a ghost running in a loop. And you have to include it because it's present by the Feynman rules. Only if you do that, you get the right answer. Okay. So, um, but that's it. You now have all the Feynman rules you need. 
You have the ghost propagator, the ghost interaction, the gauge field propagator, and a little bit ago I discussed the gauge field vertices. Right? So you now have all the Feynman rules you need. In principle, we have the complete set of Feynman rules, and we can now use it to calculate anything we want in non-abelian gauge theory. Now, uh, in practice, uh, this course, QFT2, is pretty much over. So we won't really get to, but in the second half of today's lecture, I will say a few qualitative words of what happens if you calculate stuff with this. Okay. Now, um, I want to talk about the ghosts a little bit more. You might have some questions about these ghosts, and I want to I wanna talk about this. So here are some questions you might have. Number one, can I make the ghosts in a particle physics experiment? So it's kind of worrying, right? You, you know, you, you turn on your accelerator and suddenly a ghost comes out. That might, that might seem weird. And uh, the answer is no, you can't, all right? Because they're not real things, all right? They are a fictitious device that we invented to represent a functional determinant in the path integral. In particular, there is no such thing uh, as a ghost uh, external line. Okay? So you do not need to worry that you might accidentally make a ghost at the LHC leading to some sort of, uh, I don't know, weird hellish disaster. That will not happen. Okay, next, here's something else you might be concerned about. Notice that the ghosts are anti-commuting fields because, as I said earlier, they are Grassmann's, but they don't have um, spinner structure, okay? They're not spinner fields. There's no gamma matrices involved. They are scalars in space-time. So in particular, if you recall, I told you there's something called the spin statistics theorem, and um, it seems these violate that, okay? Because they're spin zero, but they're also anti-commuting fields. They're Grassmann variables. And uh, the answer is uh, yes, they do. But again, that's okay. There's no such thing as an external ghost state uh, because of this fact, okay? So they do violate the theorem, but it doesn't matter. Okay, and finally, the last question might seem kind of weird. Um, what are they the ghosts of? What is the unfinished business that causes these ghosts to stick around? So uh, that sounds kind of stupid, like it shouldn't have an answer. I mean, this is clearly just a name given to these particles. But interestingly, it does actually have an answer. And um, here's the idea. If you recall, the gauge field has four polarizations naively, right? If you look at this vector field A mu, mu runs over from one to four, where I mean four for each direction in, in gauge space, okay? But you know that only two of them are physical, right? You recall that from your elementary e &M course. And so the, the point of the ghost is that if you imagine having some sort of a loop, you know, um, where you have some sort of a gauge field running around, you see um, th there's too many polarizations running in here, right? Because naively, all four of these positions will run in here, but you know that only two of them are real. The point of the ghost is to somehow cancel out those extra divergences. Okay? And um, it does, this is not exactly the right, I shouldn't draw this like this, it's not exactly the right picture, but the point is the ghost lines come with a minus sign because the ghosts are fermions, they come, all the ghost loops come with a minus sign. And the purpose of these is to, um, is to cancel out the unphysical polarizations of the gluon field. Okay? So if you will, uh, these are the ghosts of the two unwanted polarizations, and the unfinished business that caused us to summon these ghosts is to get rid of these things when they run in loops. Okay? That's their role, and they can do it because of the fermion minus signs coming from closed fermion loops. Okay, this is very sketchy, but um, if you go through a careful calculation, you can check that this is really what these things actually do. Okay, and now finally, because I want to talk about QCD, we should put back the quarks. So if you recall, the quarks looked like this. We had Q 
Q bar, Q and A for the quarks. And um, if you expand out the quark action, you can convince yourself that it looks like this. I gamma mu times D nu minus I G A mu A T A. Um, so it's an IJ index, if I'm very explicit about it, and then a QJ. I put back all of the indices. In particular, I put back the color indices. Here, I runs from 1 to N. It's the color index on the quark. And um, from here, you can just read off the Feynman rules in the normal way. In particular, there's a propagator, which is the usual propagator, but it's now diagonal in color space, in field space. This is with a quark propagator. And uh, there's a vertex. The interaction vertex takes the following form. It looks like this. Um, it couples the, uh, the quark to a gluon. And um, it looks like minus ig gamma mu taij coming from here, where this ta is again in the fundamental because the quarks are in the fundamental. Okay. And now from these, you can calculate anything that you like in non-abelian case theory. In particular, you might think you can calculate things in QCD. Okay, so in the next video, I will explain what happens if you do actually calculate things in this theory, although I won't actually do the calculations due to lack of time.